Hello, I'm John Burke, and thank you for watching my lightning talk. I'm going to share with you a process that I went through to determine a better way, I hope, to uh, share textbook alternative information with faculty members and others who are interested in pursuing other kinds of course material use. Well, we know that there's a huge problem with textbook affordability. Uh, my most recent look at this in, on a local level was to run a survey of students at our Miami University regional campuses and just get a sense from them of, of what the impact of costly textbooks were uh, and other course materials and found a, a number of uh, results from this just on the screen but just to give you a, a sense of what they were responding in terms of their use and then how that affected them in terms of were they going to continue in uh, courses that had very expensive textbooks were they going to take fewer courses and perhaps have a much longer educational journey. Uh, we even saw situations in which students decided not to continue in given majors because of cost. So we know this is a problem. We know it's an issue that needs to be solved. There are a lot of ways that you can work to make textbooks affordable, and this just lists some of them, some of the techniques that can be used. And, and when I list things with cost or no cost here, I'm mainly thinking about cost to students. Obviously, there are things that do cost us as institutions, as libraries, as faculty members, so on. But there are ways to do it, and there are ways that can be fairly low cost all around for, for everyone involved if we're willing to put some time into it. And as I've seen it all along in, in my process of working with um, this textbook affordability issues and this process, faculty members are really the folks you've got to convince because they obviously are the ones teaching the classes, and they are deciding often on the uh, materials that they're using and they've really got some some input and, and can have a huge impact here if they do make a decision to uh, transform their course by going to an open source or some combination of uh, sources that are that are alternatives that are very much reduced cost or no cost for students and just sharing some some uh, some of the survey information here uh, there was this bayview analytics survey of faculty that uh, looked into uh, their use of textbooks, their use of their knowledge of OER. And the good parts here are that they're very aware of OER and that they do believe cost of course materials is a serious problem. Uh, but still, a large percentage of them are using textbooks in some format, and very few of them are using OER. So there's there's definitely some room to, to, to grow here in terms of their use of OER and to figure out ways to, again, uh, impact students by reducing costs. What we did pull out of the student textbook survey here at, at the regionals was that students, for the most part, were having to buy course materials for their courses. Three, usually on average, three of their four and a half courses on the average there, they were picking up course materials of one kind or another, and they were doing a mixture of buying and renting those. So how can faculty be reached and, and given the, uh, uh, the, the message of, hey, this is a serious problem, which many of you already know, um, and here are some solutions. Here are some ways that you can you can fix this. Well, I've tried a variety of things over the years, and I've looked to my colleagues and many other libraries and, and other folks uh, advocating for um, open educational materials and open educational use. And obviously, we've all tried all these things. You know, I've done a lot of mass emails and some directed emails. I've, I've gone to individuals that I've worked with in the past, whether uh, doing library instruction sessions or had other contact with them uh, directly to see if I could make the case and convince them to make a change. Uh, we've gone ahead and actually formed some faculty working groups through our Center for Teaching and Learning to see if we could uh, get a, a number of interested people together and, and convince them that there were you know options out there and that they could make uh, make a change. Done a lot of presentations at faculty development uh, sessions, some of our uh, year opening conferences that we have, uh, definitely, you know, gotten people interested. Um, and what all of this has led to is, you know, some contacts and, and, and conversations with people and a good number of conversions, but nowhere near enough to really impact uh, what's going on with, uh, with students here in, in our institution. So I really felt like I needed something new. I needed to try something else. And what uh, struck me is at the time I was really thinking about this and trying to trying to take a, a new direction with it, uh, I happened to be working on a master's in instructional design technology here at Miami. 
And I thought, oh, this would be a, a good project to, to work through and to really think of uh, a way to apply some of the skills I picked up in the program and decide if there was a way to uh, really apply this to textbook alternatives and convincing faculty that there were options or were ways to pursue this. So after some thought, came up with the idea of a course. What about a course? So faculty are familiar with courses in Canvas, and I thought they would be able to work within that environment quite well. But what if I did a course so that the, it would enable both some flexibility um, in the way I would set it up, but some flexibility in when they were taking a look at the course. Uh, there wouldn't be an immense amount of pressure like they had to be there at a certain time or had to be there as, um, in a certain place. Uh, but that I could pass on valuable information within this setting. And that's really where I came to the idea of actually putting together a course in Canvas so that it'd be, again, familiar environment, easy way to get in. The idea, though, is that faculty would self-enroll in the course. They'd be able to follow um, through five modules of information, doing some activities within, and uh, really follow their own pace, take their own time. So there would be no grades, there would be no due dates. It wouldn't be imposing in that way or, or a lot of pressure in that way, but there'd still be a way for them to get in and, and encounter the material, take it at their own speed, review things as they needed to, but still have the opportunity to interact with me and with other librarians and get feedback from some of the ideas that they've had or the things that they've tried, uh, see what they've learned. And, uh, my real hope was that this would be much more manageable uh, for me, too, and, and for any other librarian who'd be interested in, in collaborating with me. But uh, in terms of trying to get a group of people together, as we've done sometimes with the faculty working groups, it can be difficult to get everybody in one place at one time. And even if we were to stretch that over a few weeks or whatnot, it gets even more complicated sometimes. Uh, but this would be a, a chance for, for them to, um, by self-enrolling, get involved, get in there, and there could still be a group of people working on this at the same time, but all at their own paces. The other idea I thought with the course, too, is that it could be much more interactive than other ways I've thought to solve some of the problems with, uh, you know, synchronous learning and so forth. Like, well, I could make a recorded webinar, I could make a video tutorial, but it's not very interactive for the people watching it necessarily. So that was the, 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 the goal and the route to take here. The other hope as well is that I could really provide uh, by doing this, uh, find find that sweet spot. Where where was it going to be um, enough information to get them going, enough skills that they could try out and, and see what they could do on their own, but where would it, it would not be either an overwhelming amount of information or that they would be left entirely on their own. So I was trying to figure out a way to balance it in here, and that was what I what I pursued. So how I went about this again, picking up uh, from the instructional design or instructional yeah instructional design program. Um, really went through these steps, kind of working through a needs analysis, what, what seemed like the uh, content, the information that people uh, pursuing this, faculty pursuing uh, textbook alternatives would need to know, uh, doing a bit of learner analysis, looking at folks both who I interacted with on this directly, but just faculty members in general who I, who I knew and who might be interested if, if they were going to take this on. Uh, also looked at certain tasks that I wanted them to pursue, some of which are very straightforward. I might have them take a, a very, very short review quiz on something, or I might have them do a short activity. But in other cases, I, I was going to have them do more involved, like look at looking at their course materials and deciding, well, is this an area I could replace? How could I do so? And then, then assessing from there. So looking at the, these different tasks, uh, one thing I, I, did create, um, of course, for, within this were a number of learning objectives, uh, both for the course itself and for individual learners. I will just highly recommend if you are ever <laughs> needing to correct, can create learning objectives, as we probably all are at one point or another, uh, the, the find Bloom's wheel. So Bloom's taxonomy uh, displayed in a very nice wheel form. You'll find it at various places. I grabbed one from Johns Hopkins, but it's uh, just a very nice PDF with a lot of a lot of action verbs uh, in all the different areas of Bloom's taxonomy, so you can really fit given activities there quite nicely. So just recommending that. Um, I did in in going about this this process of design, I really looked at a, a combining combining two different approaches to uh, uh, to learning a uh, more of a constructivist uh, approach, where people are doing a lot of um, uh, creating things on their own, experimenting, trying things out. So I wanted to give them some practical opportunities to see real world application by what I was sharing with them and then how they could actually make something out of it. And in the end, I hope they would make some uh, decisions of 
of uh, course materials to to put in place of, of what they were using. And then also the connectivist approach uh, to learning, which really looks at connecting people in a in community and commu connecting them with other resources they can use. There's, as you might imagine, there's a lot of resources shared, but also the idea of if I had multiple people taking part in this, they would be able to see a little bit of each other's work, not everything, but a little bit so that they could make contact in that way. Basically, I would have them at the end of this share a bit about what they learned and what they did, and that might give people an opportunity to connect later as well. So I uh, did have an assessment plan as well, multiple ways I had them uh, kind of act on what they learned. Uh, and then I went through a very nice informative evaluation process where I pulled in subject experts, other librarians, other um, instructional designers to take a look at the course and give me feedback on it. And then also I was able to recruit five faculty members uh, who went through and actually tried out activities in, in um, the modules and gave me their feedback as well. So I was able to really um, refine and, and improve upon uh, the uh, design there. I uh, did, of course, follow um, an approach of uh, make this an inclusive design. So really following the universal design for learning uh, approach and just trying to make this work for everybody. So it will it will work well, my hope is, and be very accessible. Um, luckily, Canvas has a lot of accessibility features built in that helps a lot, but trying to build that into the, the entire design of the course and the materials included. So here's just a shot. This is the opening screen of the course. Just give you an idea of what this looks like. Pretty basic, but um, just a way for people to, to jump in uh, and uh, show it's pretty simple or arrangement of the course. Really just uh, some room for some announcements, a syllabus, five modules, um, and then grades. Though I said there wouldn't be grades, <laughs> there actually is a, a grade area where it essentially shows progress. Have they have they done certain activities? And then I did for uh, some of the activities I actually gave, uh, I did give sort of a grade just to give a guidance to them, basically. Like, well, how did how did you do on this? Oh, you did really well, um, you know, on the, on this particular activity. So that was that was the goal with in, still including the grade book option. And then this is a, a bit from the syllabus. It does list the five modules I broke this down into, and I really considered that quite a bit. Just how how much content did I want to have, and, and but also what content I needed to to get the information across. So I hope this was a good breakdown of, of the five areas or five modules that uh, would give them, uh, again, a good bit of information to understand uh, the background of open education and, and OER, but also then very practical things on how do you find these? And, and then if you apply this to your course, what does it look like? Uh, and then this is just an activity from the course. This is actually one of the final activities where they really uh, took a, a Google Doc that I prepared with some questions on it. And they would download that and fill it in and, and again, think through the process of, of uh, making making changes to their course readings and then upload that. And I would give them feedback on it as well and suggest other areas that they could look at. So, so far, um, just finished this up in November of last year, 2023, launched it this February in a bigger way uh, with uh, to our regional campus faculty and have gotten some nice feedback from it. but. Thus far, 14 faculty members enrolled, so not a huge number. Um, and uh, as of yet, no one has truly finished the course or, or really followed up for additional help. So that's been the, the not yet successful, but my hope is that uh, with just having it up for the one semester, my hope is really uh, I've already made a bit of a push for people to consider working on it in the summer, which I think I'll, I'll get some takers from that. And um, then I will, of course, just kind of keep reintroducing this uh, through the semesters. But my hope is to get get more people involved as we go. So I am also very happy to have anyone uh, take a look at the course and also to use the materials in the course. Um, and uh, basically, if you just emailed me, I can add you to that Canvas course, even if you're not a Miami person, happy to have you do that. And everything is available uh, through a Creative Commons license, so I'm happy to share anything there. So I look forward to your questions uh, in Discord and got my email there and also a link to the presentation and very much, again, looking forward to, to talk more and seeing how I can further uh, improve or, you know, really refine this course uh, to make it a good outreach to faculty. Thanks so much.